Hello, everyone, from wherever you're joining. Thank you for being here today for this NCAR Explorer series lecture, The Lower Fringes of Outer Space, the Thermosphere and Ionosphere with Dr. Li Ying Qian. It's been a challenging time for our community, and so we really appreciate all of your flexibility in rescheduling this event. My name is Dr. Dan Zietlow, and I'm an education specialist here at the National Center for Atmospheric Research, or NCAR, which is a world-leading organization dedicated to understanding Earth system science, including our atmosphere, our weather, our climate, our sun, and the importance of all of these systems to our society. I'm really excited to be with you all today to learn more about space weather and space climate. So for this event, we'll be taking all the questions at the end of the lecture, but please definitely submit any questions you may have throughout the talk using the Slido platform. So if you scroll down this web page just a little bit, you can see the Slido window just below where you are seeing the live stream video of this event. Also be sure to join Slido so that you can add your thoughts to our work lab question. What do you think of when you hear space climate or space weather? This lecture is also being recorded and will be available on the NCAR Explorer series website. Now, before I introduce our speaker, let's go ahead and check out your thoughts on our work cloud. Paula Brett, could you go ahead and uh, show that for us? Yeah, so right away I see solar wind, cold, plasma. I love the NCAR exclamation point. Uh, magnetic field, aurora, drive, space weather, electromagnetic activity, RF propagation, variable, cosmic, the final frontier. That's a great one. Uh, yeah, I'm seeing so many, so many great thoughts on here and th thanks for adding them. All right. So with us today, we have NCAR scientist, Dr. Li Ying Qian. Uh, Li Ying joins us from the High Altitude Observatory, or HAO, at NCAR, where she focuses her research on the physics and dynamics of our Earth's atmosphere. Li Ying holds a bachelor's and master's degree in atmospheric sciences from Nanjing University and the Chinese Academy of Science, a master's degree in computer science from the Pennsylvania State University, and a PhD in meteorology, also from Penn State. She is currently investigating such questions as how the composition of the thermosphere changes with the seasons and how the global electric field impacts the ionosphere in the equatorial and low latitude regions of our planet. And so with that, please, welcome, uh, please join me in welcoming Dr. Li Ying Qian. Okay, so uh, I will first share my screen. And... Uh, Sorry, I need to start my video first. No problem. There you are. <laughs> and as we get set up, I also just want to add, I see a new, a new comment on our work lab. We're going to need a bigger umbrella. I love that. That's, that's fantastic. <laughs> okay, so uh, welcome to this NCAR Explorer lake lecture. Today we will explore the lower fringe of outer space, the therm thermosphere and ionosphere. So we probably have all heard about outer space, but the thermosphere and ionosphere is probably not something that we talk about in our everyday life. So when I say the thermosphere and ionosphere, uh, you might have questions like, uh, where is the thermosphere and ionosphere? What is in it? What is happening in there? Why do we care about it? And how do we get to know it? These are the questions that I will talk about today, along with some fun facts. So first, where is the thermosphere and ionosphere? So this is a NASA image that shows the atmosphere of the Earth. So if we look at the bottom, we see some landscape and maybe some tree, and then we see uh, clouds and, uh, and an airplane. So this is the lowest layer of the atmosphere. Uh, that's where we live. It's called a troposphere. Above troposphere is a stratosphere. Stratosphere is where the ozone layer is. And above the stratosphere is the mesosphere. 
mesosphere is where uh, all the medias that comes into our atmosphere uh, get burned up. And above the mesosphere, from about 60 miles to 400 miles, that's where the thermosphere is. So this is this blue part. And now the ionosphere, this yellow, yellow color. So ionosphere is not a separate layer. It uh, occupies the same space as the thermosphere. And it also overlap with parts of the mesosphere and the parts of the atmosphere above the thermosphere called the exosphere. So, um, so the thermosphere and the ionosphere is where the low Earth orbiting satellite flies. So we probably all familiar with the International Space Station. So that's where the International Space Station flies. It flies at about 400 kilometers. So now in the nature, there isn't really a boundary where the Earth's atmosphere ends and the outer space begins. But the airplane and the spacecraft, they are under different jurisdiction. They are subject to different law, different uh, regulation and uh, treaties. So it is necessary to have a, a boundary to, do, to define where the atmosphere ends and the space, outer space begins. So FAI, which is a international standard setting body, they defined a boundary at uh, 100 kilometers called the common line. This is about 62 miles. So that's exactly where, about, uh, where the thermosphere begins. Um, so this uh, common line defined where the airplane above this line, the airplane will, the air is become too thin for airplane to fly. So, so here, so we see that thermosphere and ionosphere is uh, right at the lower fringe of the outer space. So you might ask why for the same space we call two names, thermosphere and ionosphere. So that's, uh, that is what I will talk about in terms of what is in it. So it all starts with uh, the thermosphere. Um, so this is a NASA image that is taken by the International Space Station. So this part is the Earth and this is the orange color is the sunset and then troposphere and then goes up is the stratosphere and the goes up mesosphere and then as a, this blue color fade into the dark darkness. And so this air area is the thermosphere. So this is what the, the air particles that is in the thermosphere. It is the oxygen and the nitrogen. That's uh, the same air, air particles that we have in our, in the troposphere where we live. But in the thermosphere, there's one more thing, one more particle. It is the atomic form of the oxygen. So now the sun, sun's radiation coming into the thermosphere and this uh, sun's radiation gave energy to these air particles and knock or which knock off the electron that is in this, uh, uh, this molecular and at atoms and, uh, and make the ions. And these ions also go through some chemical reaction. And in the end, we get these uh, ions and the electron. And also in this process, um, this, in this process, there's a heat that is released into the atoms in the thermosphere and hits the thermosphere, makes thermosphere very hot. So now in this space, we have uh, neutral particles, we have charged particles. So we use the name thermosphere to call this neutral part of the, the neutral part of this space and, uh, and the ionosphere call uh, to, to, to use ionosphere to say, to, to call this uh, part that is the charged particle. And later on, we will see it's, uh, it's good to have two names to, to distinguish this neutral part and the charged, charged particle of this space. And we know that this air in this space is very thin. And uh, so, the, but the amount of this particle uh, and uh, how they change are very important because they enable and uh, also impact our space technology. So here in this space, we know that uh, we all know this is an uh, international space station flying in this uh, space. And, uh, 
the SpaceX as Starlink internet satellites also fly in this uh, region. And this uh, space flight, commercial space flight, uh, will also come into the lower, lower part of the thermosphere and take passengers to uh, ex experience zero gravity. And this uh, GPS and the high frequency radio signal, they transmit through the ionosphere, uh, which is a charged, charged part, charged particle, charged part of this space. Um, so now what is happening in there? So here, this is a NASA image that shows a hurricane. So this is a, this one of our weather phenomenon. And this is also NASA image that shows the Arctic ice. And because of the global warming, so this uh, uh, ice becomes, um, ice area become less and less. So now in the space, we similar, we have also have a space weather and a space climate and even space climate change. So on the left, this, Im this image shows a uh, aurora, which is also called the Northern Lights. But you know, in the Southern uh, Antarctic, there's also aurora, we can also see aurora. Uh, so this is, a, uh, this is a probably the, the only way that we can see the space weather. Uh, the, with our naked eye. And on the right, this image is also a NASA image that shows the uh, space object that is in the, in, uh, in the space. And uh, because of, um, later on, we will talk about because of the space climate change, uh, this, uh, um, this space object, which most of them is uh, space debris, and they are accum accumulate faster and faster, which cause a problem, and which later on I will talk about. So what uh, this space and the space weather and the space climate, what are the cause of this space weather and the cli space climate and the space climate change? Well, the cause are the sun, the earth, and the, the weather and the climate that is in the sun in, in the sun's atmosphere and the earth and the earth's, earth's atmosphere. So this NASA image that shows uh, uh, called what we call the 11 year solar cycle. So this is the sun's climate. So these bright spots uh, are the active region. So this um, in 1996, we see this uh, sun is very quiet and then it become more and more active by, by the year 2001. So we see that the sun is the mo most active in this cycle. And then it become quieter and quieter again. And then finally it become very quiet and then goes on next cycle. So this is climate of the sun and it will cause uh, space climate. And now in the sun and the sun's atmosphere, there's a, uh, weather. So the two most important weather thing, weather phenomenon is called a solar flare and a corona mass ejection. So they usually happen um, um, in the area of sunspots. And so we probably have heard about solar storms. So when we talk about the solar storm, it is uh, uh, mostly it is uh, caused by this, uh, we are talking about the solar flare and the corona mass ejection. So here, this is a NASA image that shows, uh, uh, shows a, a solar flare. So these bright spots, that's a solar flare. And this solar flare happened on October 28, 2003. And actually, this is a very active period of the sun. It lasted for a period of um, more than one week. And in that one week, there was uh, several solar flares and uh, several corona mass ejection. And uh, because this is uh, close to the Halloween, so we actually call this, uh, uh, those storms Halloween storms. And now you may ask, what, how, how does a solar flare cause space weather? So remember earlier, I talked about the sun's radiation coming into the thermosphere, gave, gave energy to the air particles there and make this uh, uh, charged, charged particles and also gave the heat to the thermosphere. So what happens during a, when a solar flare happens is there's a burst of increased uh, solar radiation in the part that is uh, 
uh, absorbed by the thermosphere. And this burst of solar radiation uh, causes a burst of the heat into the, the which heats the thermosphere, and that can cause the satellite to lose altitude. And also, it causes a burst of the, uh, the making of these uh, uh, charged particles, and uh, so which we call the ionosphere, what's in the ionosphere. And now the GPS signal and also the high frequency radio signals, they're trans they transmit through the ionosphere. They, their transmission uh, is affected by the how much the charged uh, these uh, charged particles are in the ionosphere. In the ionosphere, so this burst of the increased charged particles will disrupt this uh, GPS signal uh, and uh, radio signals, and even cause a blackout. So that's how solar flare cause space weather and affect our space technology. And. Um, the, the another space weather phenomenon from the sun is the corona mass ejection. So this corona mass ejection is this uh, uh, very hot gas stream of the hot gas uh, that erupt from the sun. And in this hot gas, there are very high energy charged particles. And uh, these charged particles are magnetized. So come with them are the magnetic field. And uh, when, they, uh, when they are released from the sun, they go into the space and they goes, uh, goes, uh, go, goes all directions. And this, uh, uh, this stream of hot gas, we call it uh, solar wind. So if a stream of the solar wind travel towards the earth, and um, so it will, after two to four days, it will come to the earth. And we are, so this uh, high energy charged particle uh, and the elect, uh, they are very harm, they are harmful to us. We are pretty much, for the most part, we are protected by the Earth's magnetic field because the Earth is a giant magnet. So it has magnetic field. So they protect us from this solar wind. But this protection is not complete. So when the, this uh, magnetic field in the solar wind and magnetic field of the Earth, when they align in a certain way, they connect, they become one. And that open a channel that allow the high energy particle from the solar wind um, coming into the thermosphere through that channel. And also, um, this charged particle has um, uh, electromagnetic energy. And this electromagnetic energy also coming into the thermosphere and the ionosphere through that open the channel. And when this energy coming into the thermosphere and the ionosphere, they again, they heat the thermosphere and the ionosphere, cause satellite to lose altitude and they change, they cause a burst of this, uh, again, cause a burst of the uh, charged particles. They change the amount of the particle. They move around everything. They cause disturbance in the ionosphere. And then you can imagine that uh, will cause disruption to the GPS signal and uh, those uh, high frequency radio signals. So that's how a CME, corona mass ejection, uh, causes space weather and affect our space technology. So now let's talk about the Earth, the Earth's weather and the Earth. So here, this image uh, here, we have a thunderstorm, cyclone, and even volcanoes from, and also the topography, which is a mountain. So this process, this phenomenon, they can excite waves and we call these waves gravity wave. And also the sun heats the earth uh, during the day and not at night. And that difference of the heating between day and night, that also excite waves. And we call that wave tides. And this gravity wave and the tides, they are waves. So they propagate. So they certainly propagate upward towards the thermosphere and the ionosphere. They can propagate all the way to thermosphere and ionosphere. And how the waves can cause space weather. 
So, uh, so here in this image, this uh, orange color uh, representing the ionosphere. And uh, so when the wave uh, travel into the, uh, into the thermosphere and ionosphere, they cause something like that. They cause disturbance in the ionosphere, look like that, and uh, look like a bubble. So actually we call it plasma bubble. So this is a GPS satellite. So it sends out GPS signals. When this signal travel transmit through this undisturbed part of the ionosphere, um, this airplane receives this, uh, have a clear reception of the GPS signal for its navigation and positioning. But when the, this GPS signal transmits through this bubble, then at the ground, when we receive this signal, it, it will be distorted and there's a fuzziness. So this, this is how the wave can cause space weather and affect our space technology. So now the, another thing that is also from the earth is the greenhouse gas. So we probably are familiar with carbon dioxide, methane, water vapor, ozone, but the one that causes the uh, um, most problem, causes the largest uh, space climate change is the carbon dioxide. So we know that the carbon dioxide cause a global warming uh, in troposphere, in, in the atmosphere where we live. And this global warming in the, in, uh, in the troposphere is a 0 0.3 degree Fahrenheit per 10 years. Um, so it sounds very small, but we know the consequence is larger. We already see this ice at Arctic uh, is uh, shrinking the amount of the mass shrinking. But now you may ask, what about the uh, atmosphere above the troposphere? Well, the, above the troposphere, actually it's global cooling. Um, so in the stratosphere and the mesosphere, it's about two degree Fahrenheit per 10 years. But in the thermosphere and the ionosphere, uh, it is the largest, it's a four, four degree Fahrenheit per 10 years. So it is more than 10 times of the global change that we experience here in the troposphere. Uh, so now you, so, so actually it's easier for us to, to, to find the evidence of this uh, global cooling in the thermosphere and ionosphere because it's, it is a, a lot bigger. And uh, so now how does the same uh, carbon dioxide, it causes global warming in the troposphere and it causes a global cooling above the troposphere. So well, the answer is here. So uh, these two image, this here, the lower image represent, representing what happens in the troposphere and the upper image call, representing what's happening in the atmosphere above the troposphere. So here in the troposphere, uh, this is a carbon dioxide molecule. So carbon dioxide receive energy from, infra, from, the, from the Earth from the Earth's surface. So Earth's surface uh, radiate uh, this uh, carbon dioxide, uh, radiate infrared radiation. And uh, when the carbon dioxide uh, absorbs this energy, it has two ways to lose this energy. One way is through collide with the air particles and give this energy to air particles and heats the atmosphere. And the other, as a process is the other way to lose this energy is just simply radiate into the space and lose this energy. And it's a matter of so whichever, which process to, so which way for carbon dioxide to lose energy, it depends on how fast, which one is faster. So in the troposphere, um, because the, the air is much dense, much more than uh, much denser. So uh, there's a lot of air particle. So this process, the first process is faster. So this energy is, uh, uh, so the carbon dioxide gave this energy to the air particle and uh, heats the thermosphere. So that's why in the thermosphere, the carbon dioxide has a warming effect called a global warming. But in the upper atmosphere, in the atmosphere above, the air is much thin. The process, um, the carbon dioxide side actually gets its energy through the very few collision with um, uh, air particles. And after it gets this energy, again, the same two, 
uh, process. It, it uh, loses energy in the same two ways. But in the upper atmosphere, uh, the air molecules, there are very few air molecules. So before carbon dioxide can give back this energy, uh, this uh, radiation just happened faster. So it already loses this energy through the radiation into the space. So carbon dioxide has a cooling effect. So it causes a global cooling uh, in, the, in the atmosphere above the troposphere and has the largest cooling in the thermosphere and ionosphere. And another way that uh, the Earth can cause space climate change is uh, through the magnetic pole movement. So this image shows uh, magnetic pole. This is the position is here in 1900. And now it's here. So this is a slow movement of the magnetic pole uh, over a long period of time. And uh, the reason this process can cause global uh, space climate change is because uh, the, it's mostly through the ionosphere because the uh, ionosphere has a charged particle. Charged particle, how they move, the magnetic field affect uh, how, the mag how the charged particle move. So when you, the magnetic pole moves, it changes the magnetic field. So it changes how the, how the uh, those charged particles move. So that's how the, uh, this uh, magnetic pole movement can cause uh, space climate change. Um, so now, so you may ask uh, why do we care about this? Um, so uh, in the past, the space technology might uh, be uh, so used in the military, in the aviation, but now we have entered in a new new era uh, where uh, the, when the space technology is becoming more and more relevant to our daily life in a way maybe uh, we not really aware of. So, uh, so first the GPS navigation and the positioning now is ubiquitous. It's not only used in military aviation, it, it used uh, in our daily life and our the cell phone that we, our cell phone has uh, more or less have some, um, have the uh, GPS capability to receive a GPS signal. Uh, for yeah, for the same uh, for the same thing, it's navigation and uh, uh, positioning, and there are more and more satellites uh, orbiting the Earth as SpaceX and other companies uh, seek to create satellite cluster that provide a low latency and broadband internet service. Not only this coverage is a uh, global and um, low latency, uh, but also it reaches all the remote area uh, all over the globe. And the space tourism is on the cusp of becoming an industry. And uh, we know we all know that at least the uh, Virgin Galactic and uh, uh, Blue Origin, these two companies has already both conducted test flight. Uh, to take uh, passengers to the to the lower part of the thermosphere, um, so uh, it will be. I think it's in the very near future. They it will go into the commercial to take people to the uh, lower to the lower thermosphere to uh, experience zero gravity, and also the Earth ob observing fleet and um, constantly monitors our environment and those. Uh, uh, Earth observing fleet. They, a lot of them are the low Earth orbiting satellites. So here, for example, so this uh, shows the COVID-19 Earth observing fleet and these satellites, uh, um, some of them from the United States, some from some of them from other countries, and also some are commercial satellites. Uh, they fly in the low Earth orbit and they monitor uh, during the COVID-19 last year and this year, um, they monitor how the change in people's behavior changes the uh, Earth's environment. And this is uh, the GPS positioning and navigation. So these, those are the GPS satellites. They send out the GPS signals and uh, it is um, received by the airplane for the aviation, uh, for the ships uh, in the ocean and for on the ground for our car 
and for the, in, used in the farming and uh, for the uh, ground uh, communication infrastructure that trans transmit the data and uh, for the phone and satellite phone. And when space weather happens, it affects all these things. Uh, it affect, it damage, cause damages to the electronics in the satellites, um, in the in the airplane. And we know that it affects the GPS signal and the high frequency radio signal and cause blackout, radio signal blackout. And also we know that ionosphere is a charged particle. So the charged particles have uh, currents, electric currents. And those currents um, during space weather, there's a sudden change of the currents and that can induce um, currents in our um, in here, in our power grid, uh, cause damages, cause problems uh, in our power grid. And another problem of the space weather is uh, satellite tracking. So here shows this uh, yellow is this sudden jump. It shows there's a storm, uh, there's a solar storm. So this blue bar shows the number of uh, lost satellite. So before the storm, so this is the amount of the lost satellite. And when after this storm, the number of lost satellite tripled uh, and it take about a week to be able to find those uh, extra lost satellite and it goes back to before the storm uh, level. And also actually this same storm, which is a, actually it's a March, March 13, 1989, this same storm caused uh, the entire province of Quebec, Canada to, to have a electrical power blackout and that uh, lasted uh, 12 hours. So the power grid uh, industry, they developed uh, technology to be able to weather this kind of power surge that is caused by, the sp by space weather. And I want to talk about a little more about uh, satellite tracking. So uh, the US military uh, is, is in charge of uh, uh, keep track of the trackable space objects. So currently in the current catalog, there are uh, more than um, about um, 22,000 um, trackable objects and only 5% are functioning satellites and 95% are non-functioning. Um, are non-functioning, which is uh, essentially space debris. And um, some of them are empty rocket uh, in body after they, uh, after they send the satellites. And some of them are from, most of them are coming from collisions. So I want to give one example of uh, how this uh, collision, uh, one of the examples of this kind of uh, collision. So, um, so we know this uh, company, Iridium Communication Inc. They own this uh, Iridium con communication satellites constellation, and in this constellation, there are uh, there are sixty six uh, satellites, and um, they fly in the low Earth orbit, and uh, they are very good being in the low Earth orbit. Uh, the latency is very low. And uh, in 2009, uh, one of the Iridium satellites collided with a Russian um, spacecraft. And that collision caused um, more than 2,000 large pieces of uh, debris. And uh, the small ones, the untrackable ones, small one is even more. And now the NASA Orbital Debris, Debris Program Office, uh, they are in charge of monitoring untrackable populations. So this is a NASA image that shows the space objects that's in the, in, that is in the outer space. And uh, so the amount of the objects that is larger than 10 centimeter uh, is about more than 34,000. And uh, the, the space object with the size between one to 10 centimeter is uh, um, about 900,000. And uh, the object that is greater than one millimeter is 170 million. So the small amount of those are the functioning satellites and most of, most of them are space debris. 
And uh, so the next slide is an also next image that shows that is before 1957. This uh, you can hardly see anything in the outer space. And this is 1980. And this is 2000. And this is 2018. And so you see how fast the space objects are accumulating. And uh, one of the reasons, of course, we are launch more and more satellites. Uh, last year in 2020 alone, the United, United States uh, launched uh, 955 satellites. But um, the, most of them is actually the accumulation of the space debris. And um, so the space climate just uh, makes this uh, problem worse. Uh, so why space climate change can make this problem worse? Uh, remember, space climate change is global warming, a uh, global cooling. And when the thermosphere become cooler, that means actually the air become even thinner. And when it is thinner, that means there's less air particle. And that causes a less drag on the satellites and also uh, on the space debris. And uh, so that allows the space debris stay in, in the thermosphere much longer time. Because if without this, uh, without the thermosphere become cooler, the, uh, the uh, space debris would uh, lose the altitude faster and then eventually coming into the, coming into the lower atmosphere which, where the atmosphere is denser. And so they, they would burn up. And so, so, so when there's global cooling, the space debris accumulate faster and faster. So that's cause most of uh, that, that, that. So that's why it cause makes the problem worse. But what? Uh, but this is uh, really something that uh, uh, that is uh, worrisome because uh, SpaceX SpaceX alone they plan on launch. Um, about uh, 30,000 to 40,000 internet satellites, or they will all be in the lower orbiting orbits. And uh, uh, the space of uh, this satellite space debris is uh, about 17,500 miles per hour. So they travel very fast. So even a small piece of space debris, they can cause significant damage if we collide with a satellite. So, and the pe people probably largely have not really realized the pro this problem yet. And certainly have not realized uh, the problem that will be caused by the space climate change. And then now how do we get to know the thermosphere and ionosphere? So there are two ways some scientists um, uh, uh, try to uh, to and for for scientists to uh, gain understanding of the thermosphere and ionosphere. So one way is through observations. Um, another way is through uh, computer uh, through computer program, uh, which we call um, models and um, uh, modeling. So you might have heard about that. And uh, so there are different ways uh, for observations. The first is through the satellites. So these are the satellites um, that is um, in the space, in the outer space. And some of them is far away, far, far away from the earth uh, that monitors, even monitors the sun. And uh, some of them monitors the space between the sun and the earth. And some of them monitors the and the Earth's magne magnetosphere here. And, and uh, some of them monitors the thermosphere and the ionosphere. And uh, so there are, so here there are two, these two satellites. Those are recent, very recent uh, NASA mission uh, called Gold and Icon. And so uh, uh, several people from NCA are involved in this uh, two uh, NASA satellite um, mission. And these uh, two satellites monitors how, what's the population uh, uh, in, what's the population of the charged particle in the ionosphere? And what are what are how how are they how they how are they moving, and what are their temperature even, and um, 
So and uh, and also they monitor the, what's the population in the uh, in the thermosphere and how they move and uh, what uh, what are their uh, temperature. And the second way to uh, and to do the observation is uh, using the radar. So these are some of the radar stations. And this radar, they monitor, they mainly monitor the ionosphere, they monitor the charged particle, um, looking at their population, looking at uh, how they move. Um, and uh, yeah, look at how they move. And the third way is the GPS uh, network. So the GPS uh, signal not only help us to do the navigation and the positioning, but they also comes with this, give us the information of how many uh, plasma uh, is uh, on the path of the GPS signal. So, um, so this GPS uh, network, the data from this uh, GPS uh, network is very good because it's uh, global. Uh, it's all over the whole world. So they give us um, uh, the, uh, the information uh, all over the globe. But one drawback is this uh, ground uh, GPS uh, network, ground infrastructure, and they are, they are on the land. Uh, so they cannot be in the ocean. So we would not get uh, data in the ocean in this area. Uh, so that's the drawback. Um, and the third way is, um, uh, the fourth way is a satellite catalog data from the satellite catalog. So the satellite tracking not only maintain the, uh, in, uh, where is the satellites, but also it comes with uh, information about the satellite drag. And from the satellite drag, we can know uh, what is the mass density of the thermosphere. So uh, that's, uh, how, that's how the satellite catalog is the one of the ways uh, of the observations. Also, these are the four main ways of the observations. And now the modeling. So, um, so there are different kinds of models that um, study the sun, the earth. Some models just study the sun and some models study the space between the sun and the earth called the heliosphere. And some models study the Earth's mag magnetosphere. That's where the magnetic field are. And uh, some of them study the thermosphere and ionosphere. And some of them just study the atmosphere from ground all the way to the, to the, to the magnetosphere. And some yet some of them just uh, uh, in the future, it will be uh, models from from the sun, they call from sun to mud, essentially from the sun all the way to the earth, it's including everything. And uh, NCA has a long history of, uh, of this uh, developer, this uh, atmosphere model, uh, and, um, and uh, has a lot of heritage. And uh, as a national institute, NCA developed this model and uh, um, and provide for the for the for the community to use, and so we call this model community model. So it's free for for everybody else to use. Um, so um, so at NCA we have a model uh, that uh, so there's a model that is developed at NCA uh, that studies the thermosphere and the ionosphere. And there's a model that developed developed at NCA that studies the whole atmosphere um, from the Earth's surface um, to to the top of the thermosphere and the ionosphere, and actually can go all the way to the magnetosphere. Um, and um, and uh, some of the community model are, are reside at the NASA Community Co Coordinated Modeling Center for the CCMC. So uh, NCA model, one of the NCA model is also at the CCMC. Um, so now I want to talk about uh, uh, three examples. Uh, that my colleague and I uh, use these uh, observations and models uh, to, to study the thermosphere and ionosphere. So the first example here, we study how um, 
the a solar flare change uh, the total amount of um, uh, uh, plasma on the on the path of the GPS uh, signal. Um, so uh, actually we call it electron total electron content. Uh, so uh, on the left, that is from the GPS network. Uh, so uh, this is uh, the shows the uh, electron content uh, on the GPS uh, signal path. Um, so that is before the flare. And we see that the data, you know, at over the ocean, there's no data um, that I talked about uh, earlier. So that's uh, the drawback, but the good thing is uh, all over the globe. So, so that's very nice. Um, so this is the electron content before the flare. This is uh, when the flare is happening. And this is uh, the change because of the, caused by that, uh, the solar flare. And uh, oh, okay, I forgot to say, this is a flare that is, uh, that uh, one of the flares that uh, during that uh, Halloween storm period, that is uh, in 2003. And so now on the right, uh, this is a model calculated electron content. This is a model that is developed at NCA. Um, so this is a before the flare. This is a at the when the flare happened, happened was happening, and this is a the change because of, because of the flare. So we see that the model overcome that uh, problem of the data missing data in the ocean. So it covered everywhere. Uh, so. And so, so during this flare, this flare caused uh, the the electron content in the ion in the ionosphere uh, increased uh, uh, more than twenty percent. So you can imagine that burst of sudden increase of uh, more than twenty percent of uh, charged particle. How much they can disrupt uh, disrupt uh, the GPS signal and the radio signals and uh, uh, and cause a distortion of these uh, signals. So the second example here, we look at uh, um, the mass density, uh, how they change over a solar cycle and how they changes over the year, over a year. Uh, so this is uh, a mass density at 400 kilometers. Uh, so remember this 400 kilometers is where the, uh, that's where the, uh, that's where the International Space Station fly. And so this black is from the satellite uh, drag, yeah, which is uh, come from satellite uh, catalog, uh, satellite drag information. Um, so this is black is from that the mass density at 400 kilometers. That's how it changed over the solar, ci solar cycle and from 1996 and to 2013, this is more than one solar cycle. And uh, this is how they change over the year. And this red is uh, um, calculated by this uh, by this model that is uh, developed at NCA. It's a community model, and it is at the uh, NASA CCMC. And that uh, everybody can um, can use this community model. So um, so now so this model and this observation uh, allow us to know how the mass density at 400 kilometers how they behave over a solar cycle, how they behave over a year. And uh, this model calculation, they also allow us to understand why the mass density uh, uh, behaves the way they behave. And the third example is that uh, we are looking at to uh, use uh, the whole atmosphere that is developed at NCA, uh, look at how the climate change in the whole atmosphere. So here, the, this, this is uh, from zero to 400 kilometers here, looking at the altitude. So here is the latitude. So uh, this negative latitude, negative 90 to zero, this is the equator. So this is a southern hemisphere. So here, this is a northern hemisphere. So, um, so we know that uh, this, uh, so this is actually it's a, uh, so so uh, the border actually the border the uh, border Colorado the baseline baseline road actually is uh, exactly at uh, forty degree north northern hemisphere it's exactly here and so uh, 
so here, this is a color. So the this warm color uh, is a, uh, that representing the increase of the temperature, uh, which is uh, warming. And this cold color representing uh, the negative change of the temperature, which is a uh, 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 cooling. So we here see that over the over the globe, and uh, in the in the lowest layer, the troposphere, we see this warm color. So this is a global uh, warming uh, in the troposphere, and above the troposphere, uh, see this is a cooling and negative change of the temperature, global cool, global cooling. And uh, here now here uh, goes to the thermosphere. We see the very uh, largest uh, largest cooling in the thermosphere. So that's are the three uh, examples that uh, my, my colleague and I uh, use the observations and the model to study the thermosphere and ionosphere. So now some fun facts. So first some fun fact. So um, is uh, thermosphere hot? Uh, so thermosphere, so it's actually thermosphere gets its name from a Greek word, thermos. So thermos means heat. So thermosphere is hot. The thermosphere can reach a temperature of 3000 degree Fahrenheit. And so, so this is hot because uh, like uh, today, our temperature is probably uh, uh, 40 in the 40s, 40 degree Fahrenheit. So this is a 3000 degree Fahrenheit. So it is hot, um, but uh, you would not feel hot. You would actually feel cold. So why? Uh, so, um, so this is because the heat, uh, they only transferred when particles touch each other. Uh, so in the thermosphere, the air is so thin, there are so small number of particles. So uh, one air particle uh, will need to travel more than half miles before they, uh, they can see another particle, they collide with another particle. Uh, so that's why there are so little energy is transferred. Uh, that's why the air feels very cold uh, in the thermosphere. Uh, so now what is the color of the thermosphere and ionosphere? So first, uh, let's look at the color of the aurora. Uh, so earlier we talked about uh, the wind, the magnetic field uh, in the solar wind and then the magnetic field in from in of the earth, when they align with each other in a certain way, they connect, become one and open a channel to allow the high energy particle from the sun, which is in the solar wind now, and they travel down through that channel into the thermosphere. And when those high energy particle coming into the thermosphere, they gave that energy to the air particle in the thermosphere. And this air particle become excited, very, very excited, higher energy. And when this air particle calm down, uh, they give off lights. And the different, different air particle uh, gave different color. And also even the same particle, uh, they can be excited different way, different uh, extent. So when they uh, calm down, they give out different color. So that's why we, when we see aurora, we see different color. Sometimes it's green, sometimes we see red, sometimes even purple, uh, you know, blue, purple. So that's, uh, so that's the color that we can see from the aurora uh, when there's a space weather. And now this is a space hurricane. So um, you might say, uh, we have never seen this, you know, we see Aurora, but we have never seen space hurricane. So you are right. And we, nobody have ever seen space hurricane and we will not be able to see uh, space hurricane with our naked eye. So the reason is a space hurricane actually is one kind of uh, Aurora. And this Aurora always happen in the days daytime, uh, 
very close to the Arct uh, Arctic, not in the Antarctic, in the Arctic, and it's in the daytime, daylight. So that's why we will not be able to see it with our naked eye. So now how is this space hurricane different and similar uh, compared to the hurricane, uh, our weather hurricane uh, in the troposphere? So well, the, the hurricane in the troposphere and the space hurricane, both of them have very high wind. Uh, the difference is um, the trops troposphere hurricane has high wind uh, of air, air, the air is, uh, high wind of air. And in the space hurricane, these are the uh, high, high swirling wind of uh, uh, plasma. And both a space hurricane and a troposphere hurricane has a center eye that, uh, that is still. And also a hurricane bring us a very heavy rain. And the space hurricane also has a uh, heavy rain, except that uh, our, uh, the, rain, uh, the rain here is the rain of a, a water drop. And in the space hurricane, that rain is the uh, high energy uh, um, particles from the sun, from the, uh, from the solar wind, which is from the sun. So that's how space hurricane and the uh, a hurricane in the troposphere, how the how they similar, how they are same, and how they are different. So those are the uh, the color that uh, when there's a space uh, weather, but there's what about uh, what's the color when when it's quiet, when there's nothing going on, when there's no weather. So uh, so this is a, an image, a NASA image that is a. Uh, uh, from the uh, International Space Station um, that is uh, looking, looking at the horizon of the Earth. So uh, this is the Earth and this orange uh, sunset, and then it goes to the stratosphere and, uh, and the mesosphere and fade into the darkness. So here, so if you're looking from the International Space Station, looking at the horizon, so you will see the dark, that's the color of the thermosphere and the ionosphere. However, if you, if you look down, look down instead of looking at horizon and you, uh, you can see this uh, air glow and uh, they are visible light. So first at the lower place here, there's a very thin, if you look carefully, uh, this very thin layer of the green green color. So those are the color at the very bottom of the thermosphere. Um, and then if you go higher, uh, so bottom of the thermosphere, that's, uh, that's 62, 60 miles. And if you go higher at about like 200 kilometers, you will see a red color. So green and red. So that's, uh, that's, that's the color that you can see. If you see from space and looking down, you can always see this uh, green and red color. Okay, so these are the, some fun facts of the thermosphere and ionosphere. So that's uh, today's uh, lecture. So now I will uh, stop this um, my screen share and um, take a question, go back to let Dan take over and uh, also take questions. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing all of that. It was super interesting, you know, especially for me as a geophysicist, I spend a lot of time looking down, so it's nice to, to look up sometimes. <laughs> um, and before, before we dive into some of the audience questions, I'm super curious, how, Li Ying, did you get interested in studying, you know, space weather, space climate, the atmosphere? What kind of led you down that path? Uh, so, uh, in, uh, so my uh, bachelor's degree, I, I studied the, uh, the atmosphere that was uh, in the troposphere, and that's uh, you know, the weather forecast, this kind of thing. And um, when I work on my PhD, uh, you know, the, the atmosphere, they are all, actually, they are all connected. Uh, the, the, Today we have learned that the the, the thermosphere and ionosphere is affected by the uh, troposphere, but the troposphere can also be affected by uh, thermosphere and ionosphere. So they are all connected. So that's how I um, like start to look from the troposphere and it goes higher and higher all the way to the thermosphere and ionosphere. 
That's so cool. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, great. Yeah, diving, diving into the question. So it looks like our top rated question right now is from Theo. Um, let's see if I can highlight this. There we go. Um, mm -hmm. So you had talked a lot about, you know, there's a lot of track, trackable debris in, in the upper atmosphere right now, but only about 5% of that is actually operational satellites. So Theo is wondering if there's any promising efforts to clean up space debris. Um, so uh, I think there's a, uh, I, uh, there is, um, I'm not uh, know the details of those programs, but they do have a program. They do have technologies uh, to 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 clean up the space debris. Um, so um, uh, I think they use uh, they use. Uh, uh, they, they, I think they use some fuel, they use satellites and uh, uh, use satellites and uh, use some kind of technology to move this space degree, debris um, and uh, uh, either into the higher, higher, uh, higher away from the low Earth orbiting um, or I think they mostly move them to the higher, higher altitude. Uh, I don't know the details of uh, this uh, technology, but I heard they yeah, they work on this because it's really a very serious problem, especially when in the future you know, there's a, you know that even just the SpaceX is going to launch like thirty thousand for forty thousand low Earth orbiting satellites. So it's really will, will be become more and more severe problem. Which I see a follow-up question in here from Curious about how can a commercial, you know, space flight not collide with space trash? Um, so um, space trash actually they only in orbit they can maintain the orbit in the or the or the commercial flights. Um, they when they launch those space commercial flights, they certainly need to uh, to to know what's in their path. Um, they have uh, they needed to develop. They, I think they have technology to uh, to mitigate these kind of effects. Make sure that they don't collide with uh, space um, space junk. Yeah, I just have this vision of. I guess for licensing, we can't say this, but the animated movie about a robot <laughs> and when they kind of blow through the atmosphere with all the space junk, that's that's what I think of right now. Uh, great, so our next question is from uh, Theo again. Um, so can charged particles from a solar storm damage our satellites? So you talked a little bit about how it could possibly damage the electronics, but are there is there any other type of damage that could happen to the satellites? Mm. Uh, they uh, probably the charged particle uh, sh should not directly damage the satellites. They can damage those electronics, and uh, it's just that during a solar storm, the change of those charged particle. When there's a, a change of the charged particle, there also comes with the change of the heat. There's a lot of heat, and those heat can cause satellite to lose alt altitude. I think uh, that's one of the, actually it's always happens. I mean, it's satellite orbits is uh, always affected by this, um, uh, by this uh, solar storm. Uh, cause them to lose altitude and spin faster and faster. So that's the direct uh, effect on the satellites. And, and does it take a lot to completely knock a satellite out of orbit or is it just, you know, like a little bit of, you know, radiation from the sun that could really cause major damage to the, the satellite orbit. Um, they would we, they would not knock them all the way into the into okay. the like into the mesosphere so that they not even be able to maintain their orbit. Uh, so it would not because they uh, they fly about like four hundred kilometers, five hundred kilometers. They they lose some altitude, but they can still maintain at the lower altitude. And also, the, these solar storms usually like solar flare is probably like one hour. Um, two hours effect of it, and uh, so one orbit for this, uh, the time takes this satellite to do one orbit is like 90 minutes, so it probably, it will 
goes through like one or two orbit and those uh, solar storm effect will be gone. So satellites would be still be able to maintain their altitude. And the coronal mass ejection is take longer, uh, can take a day and uh, several hours to a day. And, but still this take uh, one day is like 15 orbits. So the satellites would still be able to maintain their orbits uh, in the lower, so in, the, in that altitude uh, keep on. Orbiting, and then the usually satellites has um, they have fuel carry this um, propel whatever you know this thing, and then they uh, get boosted uh, to higher altitude. So they have this kind of technology. Well, well, that's good to know, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> um, so our next question, and I apologize if I'm not saying your name correctly, is from uh, Nachiket who's wondering, can upward propagating waves associated with sudden stratos stratospheric warming events or polar vortex breakdown also affect higher layers of the atmosphere? Mm, yes, yes. Actually, uh, uh, this upward propagating wave, you know, during sudden stratosphere warming events, you know, it's not, not only cause uh, stratosphere warming, but it, the effect goes all the way to thermosphere and ionosphere and change, change the, how much this neutral particle there are, change the wind, uh, and change the, how much of the charged particles, and uh, the amount of the charged particles, and the, uh, change, and change the, and change the currents, electric currents, uh, all of those. So definitely, um, Actually, during sudden stratospheric warming, uh, this wave, um, these waves will uh, cause more uh, change in the thermosphere and ionosphere. So, actually, you can say this sudden stratosphere warming is a weather event that cause um, space weather. Awesome. And maybe staying on the theme of, of waves and kind of going back to what you were mentioning about how I, all of our Earth systems are interconnected, you know, they all impact each other. Um, mm -hmm. So Mark is wondering, you know, are the gravity waves that disrupt the ionosphere the same type of gravity waves that are detected by LIGO, the Laser Interferometry Gravitational Observatory? Um. Uh, so the LIGO, the laser, uh, the so so those um, those probably they detect the gravity wave probably at a lower uh, uh, lower altitude and then yes those gravity wave they can some of them uh, not all of them some of them can propagate all the way to thermosphere and ionosphere some some of them you know they can get filtered what you call filtered you know when their propagation speed is a certain certain amount of speed and when they are very similar to what the wind in the stratosphere, uh, in the mesosphere, they, they will disappear. They can't propagate uh, higher, um, but some of them can propagate all the way to the thermosphere and ionosphere. A lot of them, they break at the very bottom of the thermosphere and uh, ionosphere and it cause, actually cause a lot of turbulence there. And some, some of them, they can propagate all the way to higher, like higher 400 kilometers, you know, upper part of the thermosphere or ionosphere. So yes, they can be the same gravity wave. Actually this, uh, you know, this data that is um, detected by LIGO, right, LIGO, and they can be used together with the um, data that, uh, that is observed for the thermosphere and the ionosphere to, for scientists to study uh, how the gravity wave, because you know, when you look at this data at the lower altitude and the higher altitude, you can find out, figure out if they are the same gravity waves. And by doing that, you can figure out uh, what kind of gravity waves, whether uh, the, uh, what kind of gravity waves um, affect uh, the thermosphere and the ionosphere, how high they go. So this would be very useful observation to be used together with those observations that observe the higher the, the, the outer space. Yes, that's very that's very good. It's also just really interesting to think about how, you know, so many natural systems like volcanic eruptions and earthquakes and storms give off gravity waves like that's yeah. to me that's to me that's really cool. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, so our next question is from Frank. Um, how large are space hurricanes and what are the causes? This is something I had not heard of before, actually. So I'm super curious to hear more about space hurricanes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, actually space hurricane, you know, it's, uh, has, uh, they are not, they don't happen very often. And um, so how, how large is the space hurricane? You know, this space hurricane, you know, just like, uh, uh, because they are a space, a special type of uh, aurora. So their size is just, uh, uh, so it's not uh, super big, but you can say it can be like uh, several hundred kilometers, you know, uh, 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 in radius, several hundred, several hundred kilometers to, um, yeah, several hundred kilometers uh, in diameter, probably. And uh, the cause of it uh, is, um, and also space hurricane always happens in the Arctic, you know, very, very, actually very polar, you know, polar region, you know, uh, Arctic region, further into the Arctic uh, compared to the aurora that we can see. And, um, and this, um, the, the cause of this is, uh, is um, very similar to the aurora that we we can see. So basically, the solar wind that travel towards the Earth and uh, and the, the I talk about this uh, magnetic field in the solar wind and uh, magnetic field uh, of the Earth when they align. Uh, in a certain way, so this uh, the difference between this space hurricane and the uh, the other aurora is uh, the alignment of this uh, magnetic field. So this is a very special alignment of the magnetic field. They align with each other just in the perfect way. That is very close to the magnetic pole. Actually, uh, that's why it is further into the Arctic, and they align with each other. Actually, that's anti-parallel to each other in that particular region, in the Arctic region. And then they connect, they become one, become so that, that when they become one, so there's that open that channel. So the now the uh, high energy particles in the solar wind, they can travel down from that open channel into the thermosphere and give that energy to the air particles, excites them. And uh, again, when they, and when they come down, they give give off these lights. That is the uh, that is the um, that is the aurora. Uh, so that's how this happens. So it's a special form of a, uh, of a, of aurora. And uh, actually, you know, in the from in the in the past decades, you know, probably uh, we have uh, seen about. Uh, maybe a dozen of space hurricane. So it does not happen very often. And you can see it from the satellites, only can see it from satellites. You cannot see it with naked eye because it's on the daytime. You, know, you can, cannot see this color. That's cool. <laughs> uh, so our next question, and again, I apologize if I'm mispronouncing your name, it's from Nachiket. Do you have any advice for prospective graduate students interested in space climate and whole atmosphere modeling? Thank you for this fascinating presentation and thanks for being here with us today. <laughs> so, um, uh, okay, so, uh, so my advice, uh, it would be so. It's 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 great that uh, that uh, that you are interested in space climate and the whole atmosphere modeling. Um, so you can, I would say, start from. Uh, we have like a, so in our uh, in this uh, space uh, science community. Actually, every every year we have this. Uh, uh, this meeting, um, and actually this year, it's always in June, and there's a lot of students, uh, we particularly, uh, we have even have uh, financial support to encourage students to come into this meeting and interact with uh, scientists and, uh, and other students. Um, and so that would be a very good thing um, 
to to do uh, to attend a, a meeting like that that is a very uh, um, has a lot of focus on students and um, and uh, uh, if you are interested in um, uh, atmosphere atmosphere modeling uh, so it's very important to uh, to um, to know the computer programming because uh, and actually it's a atmosphere model uh, uh, we use a lot of fortune co code you know f o r t r a n it's a very old computer language so you need to understand uh, this uh, uh, language and uh, do computer uh, programming uh, familiar with computer programming and uh, and also the Yes, this is actually very helpful. Go to NASA, NASA, and also NCA, uh, and and NOAA. NOAA has a space where the prediction center, and they have NOAA has a website that has introduced a lot of space um, climate, space weather uh, information. So that's very good, and uh, NASA has uh, has a. A lot of this kind of uh, has a website that give a lot of this uh, information about knowledge about space. Uh, that is uh, really um, that that would be very good for students um, to uh, understand the space science and know a lot of things about space weather, space climate. And NCA have a website like that too. So yes, so number one goes to the website of NOAA. Uh, NASA and NCA uh, to search for space uh, weather, space climate, and you would see a lot of very good information. Uh, number two, um, learn, get familiar with um, computer programming. And number three, come to this uh, meeting. It's, uh, if you go to NCA website, you would be able to see this meeting and you can also contact me. Uh, and to go to this meeting that is uh, very much focused on students and uh, have financial support for students, uh, for students to interact with uh, scientists uh, and other students. Yes, so, so far I have these three uh, advices. Yeah, thanks for, for sharing all that. And I totally agree, you know, just, just start talking to people. The, mm -hmm. the earth and atmospheric scientists tend to be fairly friendly, so <laughs> just start talking to us. <laughs> Great, so our next question is from Edward. Um, and it's about uh, ozone in the upper atmosphere. So if ozone is destroyed, what will be the effect on the warming or possibly cooling of the upper atmosphere? Um, and actually ozone, so ozone, you know, actually it's a slightly different from other greenhouse uh, gas. Um, ozone actually, when you have um, more ozone, ozone can cause uh, warming in the stratosphere. Uh, uh, cause uh, uh, ozone cause a warming effect in the in, because ozone la layer most of ozone is in the stratosphere. So if you have more ozone, actually it can can cause uh, make the stratosphere warmer. And in terms of the upper atmosphere, uh, the ozone does not have a lot of effect in the thermosphere and ionosphere. It's a very small effect. Um, so uh, if you have uh, so most of the most of the effect uh, uh, in the thermosphere and atmosphere come from uh, carbon dioxide. So um, ozone, yeah, ozone does not have much effect. Great, thanks. Um, so it looks like our next question is from William. At lower solar activity levels, there are often bright patches in, H in uh, hydrogen alpha images called plagues. Can solar particles reach Earth from them? Um, so these are the patches uh, in the sun. Uh, so was this... Uh, alpha image. Uh, I'm not... Uh, particularly know if this uh, H alpha image is uh, on the so on the sun or yeah it should be looking at the sun uh, 
can solar particle reach Earth from them. So, so I'm not sure if this bright patch is on the solar disk. And, and so, but regardless, even at very low solar activity, uh, there's still there's still there's uh, like uh, this hot gas coming out of the uh, the sun actually constantly actually erupt this kind of high hot gas. And now we have earlier I talk about uh, you know in the lecture I talk about. Uh, Two recent mission, uh, gold and icon, and so so this uh, past uh, two or three years actually is a very low solar activity level. And what we see is even at this very low solar activity level, actually it's like solar minimum, super low, but we still see this um, effect from the sun that is coming from this uh, solar wind. Uh, that is, they coming into the thermosphere and the ionosphere, um, reaching us. Yes, definitely. Yes, at uh, at low solar activity level, uh, this solar particle can still reach us through the same process, except at less, uh, smaller degrees, smaller magnitude, smaller amount. So, so yes, the answer is yes. Great, Thank, thanks for uh, sharing all that. And, and, and building on, on that, it looks like our next question is kind of related. Um, so it may, may or may not be within your, your research realm, but Bob's wondering how about incoming cosmic rays, not from the sun, so maybe outside of our, of our solar system and their impact on the ionosphere. What is the interplay between incoming solar radiation and cosmic rays? Mm. So uh, this uh, uh, cosmic ray actually, uh, uh, what they uh, they do not ionize, they do not work uh, impact uh, the at that high altitude. Actually, cosmic rays they have uh, uh, they come to lower altitude, uh, lower atmosphere. Um, and so uh, so um, so they they don't they. Mm, their impact is not in uh, is not in the ionosphere. They come into the lower atmosphere. Um, I don't know exactly which which part. Uh, probably uh, goes to a layer like stratosphere. Uh, this kind of altitude, not uh, higher in the ionosphere. Um, or maybe part of it actually, yes, the ionosphere actually overlap with mesosphere. So maybe some of them can have impact uh, the ionosphere in the in the mesosphere part, the lowest part of the ionosphere. Um, the interplay between the solar radiation and the cosmic ray. Um, so uh, uh, interplay. So the solar radiation, you know, the part that uh, impact uh, the you know, the thermosphere and the ionosphere is actually the this is the very shortest wavelength part, you know, the, which is also the uh, the part of the solar spectrum that has the highest energy that we call like a X ray, soft X ray, and extreme ultraviolet. So those parts uh, are the are the part that absorbed in the thermosphere. Um, so. Uh, Yes, but the cosmic ray, they cosmic ray, they come to a lower altitude. So, um, so I um, so isn't so they affect different parts of the atmosphere. So essentially, great. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that, all that again. Mm -hmm. um, and if, there, if there's no more questions that that, that have come in, uh, definitely thank you to everybody for. For putting some questions in there and really sparking some some great conversation and discussion about uh, space weather and space equipment. Mm -hmm. um, and again, this this conversation this uh, lecture is being recorded and will be posted up on our NCAR Explorer series website. Uh, hopefully within the next couple of days, if not sometime by next week. Um, and we also just want to you know again thank uh, Li Ying for being here with us today and and sharing all of your knowledge. So thank you so much for being here, Li Ying. Okay, uh, then I seem to see there was a question uh, that asked if this presentation is, uh, can be uh, available. Yeah, uh, so we've been an uh, answering a couple of the questions right within the chat. Um, so this, oh, okay, this okay, I yeah, see. So the presentation okay. will definitely be uh, available in the next couple of days. Uh -huh. 
Yes, this is available, and uh, uh, a lot of image I get it from NASA, and I there's a each image, you know, has a credit, so just keep this credit, <laughs> just to be able to credit properly. Yes, definitely. So, mm -hmm, definitely. Um, yeah. So that, you know, thank you so much for being here, and thank you everybody for for joining us. Uh, we definitely look forward to hanging out next time at our next Explorer Series event. So have, have a good rest of your evening or good morning, wherever you happen to be. <laughs>